Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our last day of the Gluna 2020 virtual fuel campaign. This morning, we'll start with the awarded teams' presentations. So we have three teams that were awarded with the special prize to pitch their projects to ISA Director General Jan Werner and to Johan Richard, Scientific Advisor at the Swiss Space Office. So we will have 20 to 30 minutes presentation per team, then 10 minutes feedback, and then we move to the next team and then to the next one. So just to refresh what are the space awards, how did the student teams accomplish this successful uh, uh, prize? Well, they had to have high quality student documentation th throughout the year and especially the last final report they just submitted now. Uh, show team working also collaborating within their team but also outside with other teams and now that we had the challenge of the virtual field campaign they also had to have a successful project show show proactivity looking for partners as well as participating in the rest of the virtual field campaign events so supporting all the student teams and also participating in the space expert talks and the three awarded teams are P8 from Ampex in Germany, P11 Celestial also in Germany, and P15 Power Hub in the UK. Congratulations to the teams, and let's start with P8 Ampex. Hello, everyone. My name is... Wait. I am going to start sharing the screen. Can you see the screen? Perfect. So hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today. My name is Juan Carlos Araño Romero. I am the team leader of Ampex 20, the project which I will be proudly presenting to you today. Uh, I will first speak shortly about the team working on the project, their motivation and its mission. Then I will introduce you to the system and its subsystems. Afterwards, my teammates will present the part of the project they have been responsible for. So without further ado, uh, Let's start this presentation. Our team is composed of engineers from all over the world, specializing in different fields. We have many mechanical engineers specializing in aerospace, development, and design. Furthermore, our team also consists of electrical and environmental engineers. The transport of payloads into space for example, for research missions or the construction and supply of manned lunar stations pose immense economic challenges, in addition to technologically complex tax. With cost for payload transport of 1.1 million euros per kilogram to the lunar surface and space projects requiring large freight volumes, weight reduction seems to be essential. However, raw materials from the Moon or Mars in the form of regolith are suitable for producing habitat building um, habitat building materials. Uh oh, there is good now. Okay, so um, sorry. So as I was saying, um, impose uh, economic challenges. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, for this purpose, the uh, uh, the the moon fibers we could use it for many uh, different uh, use. For example, we can use thermal insulation, filters, fiber reinforced composites, repair textiles, and mineral wool substrates. Uh, another uh, another uses of um, Moon fiber could be for, uh, for example, fiber reinforced soils. The main mission for us is to make a machine that could be operate under the moon conditions. For that, we will, uh, we will are looking. We aim to produce an automated production machine of continuous mineral fibers from, for example, moon soil. This machine should ensure a miniaturized, a fully automated, and a robust um, machine. For that, we, we will have to use the iBlock. Uh, the iBoss is a project of the, of the founded by the uh, uh, German Aerospace Agency that is aiming to produce 
a modular satellite. For that, we have a, a space limitation of 30 centimeters inside of the, uh, uh, on its edge inside of the box. This, uh, this size is as, is as big as 3Ds on a row. The, the Moon Fiber project uh, is a, is the, it's a project found, uh, founded by the Institute of uh, Textile Technology and the Institute of Structural Mechanics and Lightweight Design at the R, uh, RWTH Aachen University. Without the Moon Fiber project, we couldn't be here. So first, I will speak shortly about it uh, in this video. It was created by uh, Antonio Gonzalez Villegas, and it's really beautiful. So please enjoy. For more than 300,000 years, humans have felt an urge to discover the unknown. With perseverance and inventiveness, we have reached the most inhospitable corners of this world. But that was not enough for us, was it? Not long ago, we succeeded in setting foot on our nearest neighbor. The moon has always attracted our attention, full of great mysteries, but also of great hopes. Half a century after that, what keeps humanity from venturing into the unknown once again? Partly, it's just a matter of weight. Sending a liter of bottled water to the moon's surface would cost us one million USD. So let's suppose we want to send a lunar base the size of the International Space Station. It would cost us 450 billion USD just in shipping costs. Therefore, the obvious question is, why send it all? Couldn't we just use materials available on the lunar surface? The answer is yes. The lunar surface is composed of regolith, a crust with basalt as its predominant rock type. This basalt is perfect for the production of mineral fibers with a wide range of applications due to its broad spectrum of good properties. For this reason, we the Moon Fiber team at the RWTH Aachen University in Germany have designed the first fully automated spinning plant for the mineral fiber production under extraterrestrial conditions. On Earth, this technology usually requires 10 meters high and different working levels for operators. Our prototype measures on its largest side only 40 centimeters and automatizes the production of mineral fibers, which has never been attempted before. The eye block is mainly made of carbon fiber reinforced materials and aluminum, which results in a weight under 17 kilograms. Within it, our technology can produce at the very least 180 kilometers of lunar fiber per hour. The modular system of the eye block allows the construction of larger systems simply by assembling them together. Thanks to its standard interface, the interaction between different eye blocks is fully ensured. Moon fibers can be used as thermal and radioactive insulation filters, textiles, composite materials for reinforced concrete, and even mineral wool for growing plants in space. Today we talk about the moon, but who knows what tomorrow may bring. Think of the places you will go. I, th I hope that you enjoy the video. Now I will sh shortly speak about the whole system. So our main goal is to heat raw materials, processable raw materials, for the for the attenuation of this material to create the fiber. First, we have a crucible that is called bashing, where the raw material will be inserted. This will be heated with induction. Uh, with an induction heating system that will melt it and through a nozzle on the bottom of the of the of the of the crucible the, the raw material will start dropping this will be catched 
and collected by a winder that will keep the attenuation of the winder and produce more fibers out of the raw material. Here in the function principle, you can see it. The electronics ensure that the whole process is fully automated and secure. Here you can see the main specifications of, the, of our system. The outer dimension of the eye block are 40 centimeters times 40 centimeters, 40 centimeters. In total, it's not more than 26 kilograms. The processable material that we will use for our first, for our first test is e-glass, thus ensuring that we have a reliable first test for this proof of concept, because e-glass is a very well-researched um, uh, material. For the next uh, for the next uh, presentation, my teammate uh, Chung Wen will present you the furnace. Please. Good morning, everyone. And so, the furnace consists of thermal insulation, induction coil, and crucible. The induction coil will heat up the crucible and the homogeneous heating of the material in the crucible will take place at 1,250 degrees Celsius. Raw material is molten with special consideration of risk minimization for other components and efficiency in terms of power consumption. The thermal insulation serves several functions, such as improvement of self-efficiency by containing the heat and sealing of the crucible to prevent foreign objects from entering. Our team performed a numerical analysis and a simulation while designing the insulation. Due to the induction coil, the induction does, uh, the insulation design is rather complex. We had to account for several types of heat transfer, radiative, conductive, and convective. Radiative heat transfer takes place between the crucible and insulation. Convection takes place inside the insulation. And lastly, conduction through the walls of the crucible and insulation. Besides that, there is an active cooling um, from the induction coil to the insulation walls. It is established that the cavity radiation around the lower part Cavity radiation around the nozzle of the crucible has a substantial effect on the heat distribution in the lower part of um, lower part of the insulation. And the cooling of the coil also has a large effect on the required thickness of the radial insulation. Um, now my teammate Philip, who's in charge of the winding system, will take over. Thank you. Also welcome from my side. The main idea when creating the winding system was to create a winder that works just as a usual one in the industry, but is fully automized. That means it has to catch a glass drop, pull it into a fiber before accelerating it, winding it around the wheel and distribute the fiber over itself. These are all tasks that are usually performed by hand by workers on the ground. So the main challenge was besides, of course, weight, space and power consumption, the automation. That's why we came up with the what we call hamster wheel design. Over several iterations, the winder has evolved a lot. From a 3D printed minimal surviving system that just served as a proof of concept and also for first tests, over a first model made from aluminum and steel, a one that enables easy removal of the fibers and a more linear distribution of them, to the one that we wanted to use in the field campaign, but didn't arrive on time, unfortunately, which modularity enables easy use and later improvements. The function principle is pretty easy. Why did we choose this design? With low rotational acceleration, the fiber is caught automatically. It's similar to picking up a spaghetti with a fork. And the more fiber on the reel, the tighter is the fit. We also designed a shell for easy removal of the fiber, which is 3D printed. Thank you very much. Now my teammate Reese will tell you something about the automation. Yes, thanks, Philip. Uh, the... Um, the workers on our journey into the space um, will be all um, robots and in these robot driven environments um, we need a 
completely um, autonomous machine that can communicate um, with us and um, other systems that would uh, work together. And um, for this reason, um, we need to automate three things in our system. First, we need to automate the um, um, temperature of the induction coil. Um, second, we need to um, automate the movement of the motors. And third, we need to um, see the um, status of the fiber if it's um, if it's caught on the um, binder or not, or um, if it's if, if it had broke. And for this um, detection of the fiber status, we use the really um, cheap thermal camera. And I was personally surprised that it worked for both um, fiber catching and um, detection of the fiber break. And other than the control test, which is um, done with the Arduino, we also um, in installed a um, wi um, module with Wi-Fi connection that would communicate um, with us and other systems. And um, this was the hardest part of the implementation because we uh, utilized the notorious serial communication system, which basically has no protocol at all, but we managed to um, make one. And um, because of COVID-19, um, our system um, hasn't been able um, to be a, a complete system. And that's why um, we couldn't um, test our system um, extensively as it should be done in a fully automated machine like this. But we um, proved all our concepts. And um, I think that our system is ready to be automized. And now we are gonna um, show our manufacturing video and sit back and enjoy. Uh, can you? Yeah, no. Where is it? Mining and production in space for space application will be a completely new multi-trillion euro economic sector. This will lead first of all to unexpected possibilities and also to new future-orientated jobs. Actually, our technology is progressing on a daily basis and the key factor of this technology is the implementation of a robust and reliable and sustainable spinning device. Such a robust technology could be scaled up, helping to install habitats and infrastructure on the moon and elsewhere. In addition, as a mobile miniaturized factory, it is supposed to produce fibers on Earth, where resources and space are limited.
Hello everyone, I'm Luca and we are now live in front of the spinning machine for five production. At the top you can see platinum rhodium bushing. The material of this is important for the consistency of the process as well as being stable at the working temperature 1250 degrees Celsius. The mold material reaches the required viscosity to exit through the holes at the bottom of the bushing. As it falls through these holes, it creates jets. At this point, they are already fibers. Are reached by the winder, which catches them, collects them, and pulls them. After a few seconds, we have enough fibers to be able to work on new components and materials. Now it's turn for those who require quality products for the construction of extraterrestrial and terrestrial habitats. Hello again. And for Igluna 2021, we would like to take the system one step further. For that reason, we are looking to try or a system in, in a microgravity and ensure that it could work in the future under a lower gravity that it's in the moon. For this reason, we want to take, uh, participate in Igluna 21 with the same vision, but with a mission one step further. Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors for the support and dedication to our cause, despite the current situation. Uh, we are very grateful for the sponsorship of Saxonia with the beautiful Platinum Rhodium Crucible, Maxons, Robust Motors, and the energy efficient induction system of Coves. Thanks to Airbus for their support, especially with Blackwave, who manufacture the reliable prototype of our winder. The Distralic Electronics have made it possible, have made it possible for us to automate the system. And the precise parameter of optrace has also been essential to this task. Thanks to Akun for providing us with fire extinguisher for our own safety. Last but not least, we would like to thank the Hans Hermann Foss Foundation for the financial support, and of course, the unconditional support of our university, RWTH Aachen, and in particular, the Moonfiber team. Thank you very much for your attention and for being here today. Feel free to ask to any question or comment you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Team Ampex. It was a very nice presentation, and we especially enjoyed your live demonstration showing your functional product actually working. That was very exciting to see. Let's start with the feedback round. Ah, it's good. Now they are showing, uh, but I think the live public cannot see it unless you speak, so I let you say so. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm pretty proud to actually uh, uh, present you the fibers that we've just spawned like two minutes ago on the live demonstration. As you see, our machine is actually working, and... Uh, yeah, we are producing actual fibers with a diameter of six micrometers as in the industry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was great to see. Thank you. And now let's move to the feedback uh, from Johan, uh, from um, Jan Werner, he's a director general, and then from uh, Johan Richard from the Swiss Space Office as well. Perhaps we start with Mr. Werner, if you have some general comments and some questions you would like to discuss with the team. Yeah, good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you very much that I have the opportunity to give some comments. And also, I have some questions. Of course, it's very important uh, to prepare for what we call in situ resource utilization, because uh, the team correctly said that it makes no sense to bring all the stuff to the moon or to Mars uh, while we have material over there. But I have some questions. You mentioned very early in your presentation extraterrestrial conditions. This I would like to know what you mean with extraterrestrial conditions, and then I will go on with some more questions if you allow me. But this is my first question to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, when we speak about extraterrestrial conditions, there are many constraints, of course. Uh, the main uh, extraterrestrial conditions relevant for a system are the microgravity and, of course, the vacuum. This could differ to the to the uh, uh, process. So for that, for that reason, it's important to make sure that it works under these conditions. 
So for the microgravity, uh, that's for sure that's uh, that's a point. But you have still one sixth of the Earth's gravity on the surface of the Moon. So when you do really the parabolic flight, so please ask the pilot also to do Moon uh, parabolic flights, not the uh, the microgravity parabolic flight, because for your uh, production you don't need microgravity. You need one sixth of the gravity. But concerning the vacuum, that's uh, for me the more important part, because uh, okay, you are you want to heat up the system by induction, and you said by radiation, but in your test you had of course air in it, so that means you are heating also via the air. Air. Are you sure that your system is also working purely with radiation? And the more important question is. How to cool it down afterwards? Uh, for that question, I, I, I would like to introduce uh, Tobias. He's the expert on thermal analysis on the project, and I will give him the, the word. Hello. Um, um, yeah. Concerning uh, heating up our um, crucible, um, as you pointed out, we are currently working with induction heating. Um, that is um, highly changing uh, electromagnetic fields, inducing heat into the crucible. So that is going to be uh, certainly working without air. Um, but for sure, the um, heat dissipation, actually getting rid of the heat, is something we are going to focus on for the next project. Um, because due to the uh, high temperature variations on the lunar surface, we, are, uh, we do expect that we have to um, insulate our whole system. Um, which obviously blocks the heat and the temperature differences from affecting our system, but it also um, makes the heat dissipation and dissipation of the excess heat a lot harder. <laughs> um, so this is uh, for sure something that we have in mind. For this year's project, we focus on um, but designing a working system uh, under Earth conditions while always keeping the, um, as you call it, extraterrestrial conditions in mind. And uh, we are really looking forward to um, putting our project on the next level for next year's Igluna project. And this is where our considerations like this come in. Because in the vacuum, you have only the radiation is a cooling. Huh? You don't have any. Mm -hmm. And this may be difficult. So the temperature of the moon is not afraid about the air. Because anyhow, you have to use the radiation. Or you can use some media that you really want to with. Uh, mm -hmm. You can also get it. So please think about that. The but, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having a hard yes, maybe if you could mute that's great. Ampex team, we hear an echo and we're having a hard time following the comments. Sorry for that. No, no, the comments was just that for me the, the vacuum, the cooling down is the more important point compared to the other one. The microgravity, because with one six uh, uh, g forces, uh, the, the system will work. But the question is whether you can really cool it down afterwards by just radiation uh, on a short distance. Huh? You need you have only a, a few centimeters until you wind it up. So therefore, this is for me the bigger challenge. But I will stop at this point, and maybe you have some more questions, then uh, I can come back if necessary. Okay, thank you for your input. Then I will give over to my teammate again. Thank you very much. And now I introduce you to Johan Richard from the Swiss Space Office. Uh, also very uh, grateful for your presence here today and welcome. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a very uh, excellent presentation. Um, very exciting for me to learn um, about your project. And um, we, we, I can see you have put a lot of work into it. Um, now that we've covered the moon situation, um, I would like to, to go back a bit to Earth. Um, you've mentioned in your video that um, this, this, uh, this technology you've developed would also have uh, applications on Earth. And uh, I have two questions there. Uh, first of all, um, do you have any plans into, into spinning this out into a company? Um, and second, how does the technology compared, uh, compared to, the, to today's um, spinning machine? You mentioned in the video the, the size, but I would also like to know a bit more about the performance of the system in comparison, if you reduce it to that size, what that means for uh, uh, in comparison of the spinning speed, for example, with a normal machine. And uh, maybe you can uh, give me uh, some insight into that. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Johan. 
Um, yes, uh, it's a good question. Um, as uh, I say in the presentation, we are part of the Moonfiber. They have a bigger scope. And part of this bigger scope is that we can create machines that are fully automated. Actually, uh, currently on the Earth, the, um, the uh, spinning plants for, for uh, fiber production, uh, continuous mineral fiber production, uh, take as much space uh, like a three-story building or four-story building. They are really big, really huge, and they require of, uh, uh, it's a labor-intensive uh, work because uh, you have to take all the fibers with the hand and put it and move it. So uh, what we are already doing, it's uh, a step uh, farther on the current uh, system on the earth because we are fully automated we can take the fibers, catch them automatically without the interaction of, uh, without any human interaction. And at the same time, we are miniaturizing this machine. So one, one, uh, one uh, system that will usually take you three story buildings. Now we are putting on a 40 centimeter uh, box that could achieve that uh, in places that it's unreachable to, to go with or to build a, uh, a factory of this size, uh, you can just uh, bring a mobile and transportable uh, spinning unit. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Uh, parts of it, thank you. <laughs> um, so one more question. Um, you you said um, yeah, you can reduce it, but are there any plans to to now to uh, to take that and and really? create the company out of it, because I, I guess um, we've heard about the problems you'll still have to solve for the moon, uh, microgravity and especially the thermal questions. But uh, right now it works on Earth. We've seen it. Um, yeah. What, what are your plans with that? I mean, did you talk to um, to any of these fiber um, fiber fiber systems producing companies or can you sell, say something about that? Uh, as I say, uh, this is part of the scope of the Moonfire team that it's uh, hosted by the by the Institute of Textile Technology Institute of Structural Mechanics of the RWTH Aachen. But uh, I know that uh, because uh, I, I'm involved on the project that they are uh, there are some companies, uh, fiber uh, spinning uh, production companies that are really interested to be able to fully automatize uh, their there is um, there is systems on on earth okay thank you very much and by the way i like uh, the idea of having a hamster wheel on the moon thank you very much <laughs> thank you thank you very much for the nice words thank you very much johan maybe uh jan werner if you would like to add uh, you had another question there oh we see you are muted okay we have a lot of questions but it's okay for the time okay great thank you very much so with this we thank again the team p8 thank you very much ampex for your nice presentation and thank you to our experts uh isa dg uh jan Berger, and johan richard it was very nice uh here's the feedback. can we say goodbye very much. thank you very much thank you goodbye thank you <laughs> it was a great opportunity for the student team, so you can see they're all very excited with this, and, and we're very thankful for you to provide this experience to them as well. So now let's move to our next team. We have P11 Celestian from BTU, uh, sorry, from TU Berlin, the other way around, Technical University of Berlin. And we're very excited to have them here today also presenting their project. So the floor is yours, Celestial. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, nice to see you and thank you for uh, providing us this opportunity ssc uh, we are uh, we are students from uh, masters in space engineering uh, technical university berlin uh, we are uh, from international uh, section of uh, of the department and uh, we have been working really hard on uh, developing communication system and uh, antenna systems for small satellites uh, we want to we want what we want to do actually let's cover this in the in the presentation So, P11 Celestial, and this is the virtual field campaign, uh, what we have for you. 
the presentation is uh, covered in two sections first we will tell you about what was our project requirements targeted uh, performance we wanted to do and then the second part is mostly about the live demonstration and the test videos we did uh, in in our project to verify our system works so i will start with who we are and uh, why this project started so we started with this project two years ago uh, when we, we wanted to do a moon mission by ourselves, we had a small uh, small ambition of doing a CubeSat mission for the moon and we were bombarded with these uh, so many challenges that uh, students and academics are facing and because of that they are unable to do this moon mission economically, let's say. And uh, by economically I mean CubeSat missions, one new CubeSat, let's say that. And uh, this is where we started thinking okay this has to end somewhere and uh, what do we need to answer first and the first problem that came in our way is why this cannot happen because your satellite is really small it doesn't have the power to do this and uh, you need to have this communication infrastructure up there in order to able to have this communication going up there and actually we started thinking why why can't we do this so we came up with a plan and when we came up with plan the advantages were numerous not just for academics or for startups but for industry for space agencies uh, like ESA there, there are numerous advantages of connectivity to the far side of the moon to the polar regions and much more so what is our plan we have a vision to go for lunar relay satellite constellation in the polar orbit we want to develop three CubeSats constellation, 40 to 60 kg satellite. The entire constellation has to be within 200 kgs, which means we'll, we need one launch to the moon and we will deploy the entire constellation. Uh, we are not developing the satellite by ourselves, so we focus on the core technology of this constellation, which is communication systems and the antennas. We have also did our, uh, have completed and compiled our link budgets to see the link margin of this lunar communication relay network, uh, where we have also made an estimate of what our ground station will look like, what kind of antennas and power we need on the ground station to close the link with the moon relay constellation. But uh, we were also asked, what do you really answer in the current industry, which is existing uh, space market? In the existing space market, when we were doing this uh, development of our communication system and uh, uh, antennas, we came across a problem that all these communication systems existing in the market, they're really hardwired, which means for the CubeSats uh, particularly and for the small satellites, which means that these systems uh, cannot be reconfigured in the orbit. Once you deploy a satellite with a particular mission, it stays there with that mission only, and uh, there is no possibility of reusability. Now, we saw recently what happens when you start reusing in space space becomes more efficient like other field of industries and uh, you know business so when you start reusing rockets things change now why, why let's take a step ahead start reusing satellites itself and for that we are working on the state of the art software defined radio technology and additive manufacturing for developing our antennas Coming to the Gluna 2020, uh, we we took part this uh, in the last year. Now we are on the on the on the last uh, almost last day of uh, this uh, field campaign. Uh, our mission was to develop a lunar communication system prototype, which works on software-defined radio, to demonstrate uh, modulation and frequency uh, reconfiguration remotely, and to integrate this with uh, additively manufactured customized antennas. And everything should be developed in-house. Our objectives for this was that we need to reach TRL level 3 from technology readiness level 1 of the satellite communication technology. Uh, we want to have a communication system that works on software defined radio, should have one U form factor and should improve overall system performance with integrating these directional antennas that we want to print. System shall re reach 1 Mbps minimum and now we are targeting 3 or 10 also in the future. System should be remotely configured, which is one of the most important criteria we want to target for reusability of satellite. Because if you can reconfigure your system, your satellite could actually as well answer a second mission while it is in the low Earth orbit or in medium Earth orbit by just reconfiguring the communication needs of the second mission and uh, using the satellite for this for the same mission in different orbit, let's say. This is the team behind this project. So we are six students, as I said already, myself, Mayank, and uh, Johannes is working with me, alternate team leader. Tushar, standing alongside me, has worked on firmware. Gohan has worked on software develop development, standing next to me. Ravneet uh, could not join us here, but she worked on antenna subsystem design. And Udit, in the middle, is working on uh, system testing. Uh, we have uh, been supported by our supervisor, Professor Dr. Klaus Priest, our technology supervisor, which is Dr. Zizung Yun, Chem and Manuel are our mentors in the department. We got external support from Luna, Apostolos and Jagdish is standing on the other end of the uh, line. 
what we present today we present our antennas that we designed we present our communication rf front end and we present you a integrated system that has communication uh, firmware in it developed on an open software platform requirements so before we go into this i would like to highlight our success criteria so we uh, created a success criteria of our own where we had this designing and printing of small satellite antenna and demonstrating its working to be 15% success criteria for us then designing and building a communication system rf front end and integrating the testing hardware another 35% of success then firmware development and integration of the entire system with firmware with uh, antennas with rf front end to be the next 30% so this was 70% success criteria of the system that was achieved prior to the test live demonstration. And on uh, the test dem uh, demonstration day on 14th of July, we, will we were able to demonstrate 30% uh, of the test demonstration. Plus, in addition to it, we were also able to do a live uh, collaboration project with Space IT. So I would say the team has performed actually plus 100% uh, in this uh, field campaign, which uh, I'm really happy about. Okay, so the project requirements virtual the actual project requirement. So I thought we should not go with all the project requirement. It becomes kind of boring. So we just created a table telling what were the key features we were targeting and were we able to achieve or not. So on the left hand side is the communication system you see. And uh, this table highlights what were the targeted requirements or the values we were targeting. And uh, with the dimensions, one new form factor was achieved. We had two operating frequencies, 2360-2361 megahertz, and we will be switching in between these. Again, the modulation is, again, there are two, BPSK, QPSK, and we will try to switch between these two as well. Uh, we used software-defined radio, and our weight of the entire system, including the antenna, comes to below 300 grams, which is uh, the targeted value. So we were able to achieve most of the, most, actually all of these requirements. Then comes the on the right hand side table is the antenna where we wanted to develop patch antenna. We did that. Uh, it's again one new form factor. Yes, we have that. And operating frequency, since we have these two frequencies, our antenna must complement these two frequencies to work with communication system. We also have been able to achieve that. And the weight is really less than 10, uh, 100 grams. And the gain is 7.4, which was also achieved. So manufacturing method right now is conventional. Uh, we could not go for additive manufacturing because of the challenges that we faced with manufacturers. But uh, we have uh, been able to develop and achieve all other things. So I think uh, we can just make this half tick, but it, it qualifies. OK, so then the project show now. Over here, we will uh, highlight what we developed in-house, what we took off the shelf, and uh, what are we trying to, uh, or what we did in the entire Igluna field. So we took uh, Raspberry Pi and uh, software-defined radio off the shelf now. We did not uh, manufacture these, but we designed our own RF front end and uh, uh, antennas. And uh, now you see on the left hand side is the entire four things that constitutes to these uh, uh, communication system hardware. On the right hand side is the software that we also designed on the open software GNU radio, where we did signal formatting, we did modulations, we had uh, these headers and footers, signal filters, and all these things were designed in a, in a Python library. And uh, now we will be demonstrating this as well today. Now I will hand over to Jagdish and he will explain you about the antenna and uh, this subsystem. Jagdish. Thank you, Mayank. Um, the present uh, presentation slides shows you the the one of the key features of, of the communication system that we have designed. The first element of the uh, system that is the patch antenna. That one that is that is shown on the right hand side of the presentation. On the left hand side, you see the two two graphs. The one uh, on the green is the simulated um, graph that is obtained from com computer simulation, and the uh, red one is from the uh, uh, analyzer, spectrum analyzer. The the apparatus was uh, for the spectrum analysis was uh, supplied from Rode and Schwartz, uh, uh, and uh, the graph represents the S11 parameters. So uh, the config configuration of the pa patch antenna is uh, is 98 by 98 millimeters in dimension, which makes it very uh, very much suitable for small small satellites. And then the thickness uh, is around five five millimeters, which makes it uh, very stable stable and robust. Um, this uh, this also withstand high temperatures and uh, uh, very uh, high vi vibrations. Um, the test test demonstration shows uh, showed us a very close match to the theoretical and uh, practical values, and 
we were we were pretty much sure about uh, about the analysis parameters that we have selected for the testing um before switching over to uh, my colleague uh, tushar we will be we, we have a small clipping that uh, that will be played in the next slide So this is uh, the uh, demonstration of a of the shelf monopole antenna. On the uh, screen, you can see is GNU radio, which is controlling the SDR, which is in the blue case, and the monopole antenna is in right upper corner of the image. The lower screen uh, is uh, FPC 1500 spectrum analyzer from Rode and Schwartz, which is recording the uh, signal which is being received from this uh, transmission section. Uh, now it is uh, no uh, no signal is being transmitted, but now you will see uh, there is a drop, and uh, this means the signal has been started. Uh, on the upper screen, you can see the waveform, and uh, the signal strength is basically 10 dB, 10 dBm, and is being received at uh, uh, the spectrum analyzer. Uh, this is the demonstration of a patch antenna. The setup is uh, still the same. The upper screen is basically the transmission end, and it is uh, FPC 1500 Rode Schwartz spectrum analyzer, which is receiving end. Uh, there is a monopole antenna on the receiving end, and the patch antenna, which is uh, first prototype of Celestial, is uh, being uh, used to transmit the signal from the transmission end. The SDR is connected. You can see the blinking light, and now the transmission has begun, and you just saw the drop in the signal strength. Uh, since this is a directional antenna, the direction matters. And if we start rotating these direction slowly, as you will see, the signal will start uh, dropping in its strength. Right now it is uh, minus 52 dBm strength and now the signal is being rotated, uh, the antenna is being rotated and uh, you will see the signal uh, strength is started increasing 52, 55, 57. This shows how directivity of the antenna is affecting. Uh, uh, my name is Tushar and uh, I'll be explaining you about the in-house RF content. So over here you can see there are two images on the top side. We have the bottom view and the view. And uh, we have developed this uh, uh, from the calculations that we have uh, gained from the link budget. So we have developed uh, this uh, PCB board uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the components that we have soldered over here. So we have a transmission line and the receiving line on both the sides. The RF is mainly used for uh, in for enhancing the signal strength of the incoming and outgoing. So we were able to uh, test this uh, in the lab facility, and we have prepared a very short video uh, demonstrating how the system works, how can we visualize it uh, uh, in the in the real scenario. And in the video setup, uh, we have a, a Rodian Schwartz uh, spectrum analyzer, where you can see that initially there will be noise floor, but when the signal is transmitted from the ground station. You can see a significant gain, and on the other side of the of the video that will be played, uh, so you'll be seeing a station that is a laptop, which will be enabling the transmission. So on the hardware side, we have installed a Lime SDR, the RF front end, as well as we have an antenna uh, attached to it, and then on the software side, we have a GNU radio uh, software, which will be run. So uh, please enjoy the video now. So, in the demonstration, I will be explaining you about the developed RF frontend and its testing procedure that is developed for the Igluna campaign. Here you can see on the left we have the top view showing all the components attached which are responsible for adding gain to the signal. And on the right we have the bottom view where we have a SMA connector which will be connected to the Lime SDR. Here we have a split screen setup to help you visualize the ongoing testing. On the top we have a computer or in case on this case the ground station setup where GNU radio software is used for transmitting a signal which can be received on the FPC 1500 spectrum analyzer from Rode and Schwartz. In the setup on the ground station we have a Lime SDR con connected to the RF front end as well as on both the sides of transmission and receiving we have installed an off the shelf monopole antenna. As you would have observed until the transmission was started the signal on the spectrum analyzer was constantly near around minus 76 dBm. As the transmission has begun and as we zoom onto the spectrum analyzer screen, we can see that there is a gain of more than 15 dB of signal power and the reading is now nearly constant around minus 60 dBm. This shows that the RF frontend is working and does not block the signal but instead adds to the signal strength. 
although this is not a final product of celestial but it shows that it has capabilities and with some further improvement the signal strength can be further enhanced yes i hope uh, you have uh, enjoyed the video and uh, now there there was actually a third video where we did uh, software testing as well but uh, for now we will all do this in live demo now uh, because of the time constraint but here i can already show you this was our setup and on the on the screen you see with the red background or with the pink background is our uh, test bed system and on the lower background with the white screen is our uh, ground station setup and we were able to communicate between these two uh, systems and control this remotely but uh, let's move on to the project setup and do a live demonstration let's see if it still works right all right and uh, so in the screen we see is uh, is a ground station setup uh, with the two patch antennas that we designed and is connected to a software defined radio uh, of the shelf and uh, there the laptop is our ground station which has this open source software uh, controlling uh, and commanding the testbed system which is on the right upper corner of the screen uh, on a on a lunar lander uh, which pts sent now we are controlling that and we are trying to reconfigure the communication systems over there and we will see how we can uh, we can control uh, the communication commands in the next live demo and for that uh, let's let's first try to know what is happening on the on the testbed system where my colleague tushar is uh, present and he will now take over and explain you this uh, system tushar can you please explain thank you Thank you, Mank. Uh, so I'm standing over here at the PTS facility. I'm standing with the lander, uh, Elena, and uh, I have already installed the systems up and running. On the system side, we have the uh, installed. We have the Lime SDR, and then the patch antennas are installed. And uh, from here, sending commands, uh, sending the data in commands, whichever will be from the system accordingly, uh, will be uh, sending the response. So this will be done a couple of times, and uh, then I'll hand it over to Mayank for the software demonstration. Over to you, Mayank. Mayank. Hello, everyone. So yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Tushar, for explaining us uh, the testbed setup. I am here. I'm standing with Guhan. I found him. He was behind the ground station, uh, trying to communicate with the ground uh, with the lander and uh, to our testbed uh, communication system. So Guhan. Please tell uh, us uh, what the setup is. Uh, Alright, please share the screen first. Alright, yes, now please explain us. As you can see on the left hand side, you see the GUI for the ground station, uh, in which uh, you can see uh, over here, you can see the change uh, two frequency, 2360 and uh, 2361 MHz, in which we can uh, change the frequencies. And uh, over here, we can see the modulation, QPS key and BPS key modulation. Uh, we can switch between these two. And uh, here is a text box where you can uh, write the command. And uh, once you write the command, you can uh, you can transmit the command to the um, testbed system, which you see on the uh, right hand side of the screen. Okay, this screen uh, represents the uh, is the it's what's happening in the GU on uh, the Raspberry Pi at the moment. So Raspberry Pi is actually representing the uh, testbed system, and it's uh, it's not on yet. Once it's on, every uh, every uh, every uh, it's, it, it will become uh, it become automated, okay. and uh, based on the command uh, sent, uh, it will uh, send us the data which it has based on uh, changing its frequency and uh, modulation. So the the communication system will be able to perform that, right? What is the what is the back based on? Can you also tell us more because there are some students listening to this as well. Okay. I mean the G, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the testbed system is actually uh, running uh, using a, a GNU radio and Python combination both, and uh, we just uh, took the uh, Python uh, created file uh, from uh, Genie Radio and use our own uh, Python scripts to uh, like ma make it uh, run as automated task. All right. Let's uh, can we do the testing now? All right. Then we will start the testing. I will uh, leave uh, Guhan alone here and uh, Guhan, good luck.
Okay, so we will see all the time uh, screen of the ground station. Now ground station uh, testbed has been uh, started and is uh, now actually coming to receiving mode and is expecting a command. We are now, uh, our uh, ground station is transmitting. Uh, TX button has been pressed and uh, the, you see these are two dots, the BPSK and you see on the screen, we have received the command, command zero. Now the system has come to its uh, system, uh, has come to its basic parameters, which is 2360 and BPSK. Now we have changed the uh, frequency we will try to receive this back and uh, the transmission will start from the uh, from the ground station and uh, we have received this but uh, i think there now we have received this yes now we have two dots so when you have two dots basically this is bpsk and when you will see four dots this will be quadrature four four dots means uh, qpsk and uh, now since you saw the ground station going offline and there was noise basically the two dots disappeared this means the signal is not received now now uh, ground station is again trying to send another command with updated parameters and uh, tx has been pressed on the ground station and the system again came back automatically on the receiving mode and it has received this command now here modulation was not updated therefore you see two dots again but frequency was updated now on the left hand side you will see the ground station will be updated again on the new frequency parameters to receive this uh, new uh, signal or data that will come from the updated system so we should receive this this would mean that system reconfigured itself and updated you see there are two dots and we were able to receive it so remotely system was reconfigured on the frequency parameters this is what will hap happen when you have a satellite in the orbit and you are trying to control it and then after completing your mission you want to do with the with the new mission and you want to have different frequencies for example and here is how you can do that now uh, the next command will go but before that the the test bed system will come to its receiving mode automatically uh, to expect this command and uh, we are ready with the uh, with the modulation update now we will try to go for it we have sent a command since this system is already on the previous thing you saw two dots because we had to do with binary now you will what we will receive will be four dots which means this will happen uh, that system has changed its modulation scheme from bpsk to quadrature qpsk let's see how uh, if we are getting that now system is about to transmit on the test bed it, now you see there are four dots so we were able to update the uh, modulation scheme as well uh, this is uh, basically the test demonstration we wanted to attempt today and uh, this basically shows that we were able to transmit and control the system uh, on frequency parameters as well as on mod modulation parameters in this frame of igluna we were only working uh, we were only working on uh, on the on the side where we worked and experimented with uh, we worked and experimented with our two uh, two parameters of the communication system which is uh, frequency and modulation scheme in the next uh, terms or in the next events near future we will explore this more uh, on its uh, single uh, pass and multi pass uh, systems which is uh, also next level for us we will also go into fpga but for now for today this was the live demonstration to show that we were really able to control the system and uh, now i will go to the presentation back and uh, uh, let's discuss the the concluding things for that i will also call my team to be back here okay so now the project partners for that i would hand over uh, the presentation to odit who will explain you uh, the support and uh, the initiatives we got odit Thank you, Mank, and thank you to Shah, uh, Guhan, and Jagdish. I think this was an excellent demonstration. And uh, as Celestial, we see uh, without partners and uh, friends, we just cannot make progress because we 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 are belonging with them and we work together. So we would like to take this opportunity to thank TU Berlin, MSc Program, and the University of Würzburg for all the technical support and the educational background, the support in terms of equipment, hardware, as well as software that was provided to us. We will also like to thank our industrial partners, especially starting with Initiative for Industrial Innovators for financing our project so far, and Rodi and Schwaz for their equipments, uh, ST Engineering for link budget review, OHP for their technical support, Neotech, as well as Space IT and TrueRC. And also, we just cannot say, but we are very, very thankful for PTS to provide us with this facility that we are able to do a live demonstration for you from this point right now. Moving on, ramp up. So uh, we, as Celestial, we started from a point where we were a university project, and now we are at a point where we can gladly say Celestial as a game in Germany. And this wasn't achieved on a day's work or a 
it's been a long journey and to continue on this journey and to further increase our vision of going to the industry we would like to know that we are looking for funding which is 750000 euros and these funding has been earmarked to be invested in r and d and market uh, market entry so for the feedback we would like to receive more technical feedback in terms of the antennas and the communication system that we are working on we would like to build more partnerships because the moon is not for us the moon is for everyone and we are just in it and we want to take this partnership further down line and also develop systems that can be used for earth-based application especially our very good antenna which is very lightweight and very cubesat friendly this was the aim that we started with we also want to build our own facilities and development and testing of our products in the near future and in case scenarios we would like to go ahead with our in-orbit pursue further pilot projects with different partners in, in, around Europe and also across the world. So feel free to contact us as many times or whenever you feel like, yes, there is a possible collaboration, like to join ahead our hands and go for the moon. And to highlight some of our next steps that we plan to achieve in the next couple of months, we want to go for an in-orbit technology demonstration of our products. We want to also launch the antenna as of our product in the near future. And we are also aiming for Igluna 2021, where we would like to organize a space community to create more interest among the people and the students who would be joining us. And, and we would be really able to find your support. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Odit. Uh, and uh, regarding the lessons learned. So just coming to the end of this presentation, uh, I think it's important that we reflect back on our uh, journey and we of this one year with Igluna and SSC and we see what were the les lessons learned. And this would also be something that further teams coming uh, in Igluna 2021 can uh, maybe uh, take into account. So for us, documentation was very important. Actually, preliminary design review report was one of the key things that explained us a lot of things, miniature things which can be easily ignored, yet very important, were understood in this uh, documentation. Documentation presentations made very easy for us to communicate with our funders, uh, with our partners, and with the other uh, university projects to actually seek uh, and showcase what we are trying to achieve. On the project man management side, I think uh, the common platforms to talk and uh, have a collaboration of teams is very effective. This uh, played a very key role in uh, making this communication very effective even during this COVID uh, time when we were unable to meet and we lost our labs facilities also. And different task and subtask segregation help tracking the project. So please take care into this account that have something kind of this kind of platform to work. A bigger learning comes from Swiss Space Center actually, uh, because uh, we feel I felt personally also, and our team feels this that uh, being more vocal about your project challenges helps you a lot. People when they know that you are facing some challenges might even able to join you and help you out. And uh, th this sometimes happens as a mutual benefit. Uh, so be vocal about your project and also when. When you tell this to Swiss Space Center, a lot of things get very easy because they have uh, they have a lot of experience with these projects. As a student, you sometimes don't, and uh, also they 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 like to support you. They are there to support you. So please take advantage of uh, this this uh, uh, option that is available during the Igluna, and also just don't rely on this. Be proactive in your approach because uh, taking help and being proactive was two key things that solved our big challenges for us as uh, as students in this project. And uh, moreover, I think um, uh, being project teams which are next to you, they are also not a competition anymore. This is a collaboration project. So read their documentation, try to understand their objectives, try to help them reach their objectives because. They this can also help you to collaborate better and reach your objective better. So this can be uh, mutual growth and mutual benefit that can help and you can find common synergies between the projects which is uh, which is something Igluna aims for as well. So try to do this and uh, this uh, project would be would be fun and please enjoy the project whenever and whoever is doing this uh, enjoy the project is a key thing. 
and uh, over here only i would also like to thank swiss space center actually where they have uh, provided us uh, us uh, so much uh, input so much feedback that we were able to do this i think uh, uh, the team um, led by dr tatiana is uh, is excellent they are very professional uh, i actually have this uh, feeling that uh, we sometimes uh, as a team were not so much responsive as much as uh, uh, swiss space center is responsive you need to match up to them in order to have this effective work and uh, the the way they organize this uh, travels the way they organize the stays of the students is very comfortable very well planned uh, i don't even know when they get this time to do this but they are so much that you can see the hard work goes behind this so i would really like to congratulate uh, swiss space center at this time uh, for their efforts especially during these uncertain times when you were not even aware what is going to happen in next week uh, this was really commendable and i would this is one of my learning that i will take with me i mean i already know as a team lead over here how much hard it was to handle one project and these guys had 15 projects to handle so this is uh, 15 times much tougher for them and uh, thank you once again over here and one more thing that i want to cover is in the last so we are now celestial space technologies game beha and uh, this is our official website please visit us uh, you will have contact informations in there uh, also i would like to take two minutes here to just uh, highlight uh, key achievements we did uh, up till now when we started in the actin space hackathon in 2018 last year we we got third prize in inno space masters award and then we got selected last year only in uh, igluna and today we are uh, concluding our igluna journey here in this presentation uh, two months ago we also got selected into isa bic bavaria incubation center and we have uh, therefore uh, formalized our uh, our uh, project into into an into a company and uh, now we are going towards moon so our every step goes towards moon and um, that's uh, that's something uh, i think uh, i just wanted to highlight uh, these are our, our contact details. Uh, feel free to contact us. And um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayank and the whole Celestial team. Uh, thank you very much for your nice and kind words to, towards the Swiss Space Center. We're very happy you enjoyed this experience. And we're very happy for you today that you have this opportunity with the special award to, to present again your project today, especially to ESA Director General and to Johan Richard. Uh, we're very happy that test demonstration worked. You were able to transmit your signal. So again, uh, very good job here. Congratulations. And now let's move on to the feedback. So we can start with uh, Jan Werner. Isa DG, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And congratulations to the work uh, you were doing. It's uh, excellent. It's uh, from my point of view, of course, I'm a civil engineer. I cannot say in detail about all these electronical aspects you were mentioning. However, therefore, I try to ask you a totally different question. You are saying communication to the moon, and you are talking about orbiting the moon for communication. So which orbit would you select for that? I mean, uh, in order to cover uh, some actions on the surface of the moon. So uh, did you think about that, or are, are you just looking to your technology of uh, how to create the best antenna and uh, the signal processing? Yeah, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, so uh, actually, we did uh, we did our research actually on this proper, and uh, we came across at least fifty five uh, missions ourselves, and we also know that there are around seventy missions being in development phase uh, that are going for moon in the next decade. Uh, so the the all these missions are majorly focusing on uh, pole polar regions of the moon because of the availability of water mainly. Uh, and this is where these missions are going. And as as space engineers, I think it is also our responsibility to contribute to this lunar and lunar economy exploration and cis lunar development. And this is why we chose a polar orbit, which will have uh, at least um, a 2,000 kilometer polar orbit and uh, on the moon, lunar polar orbit. And this is where uh, this is chosen because we have these three satellites at 2,000 kilometer or, uh, altitude, focusing and giving 24/7 uh, con connectivity on these two poles. So they, these are our focus area. We are not trying to provide communication on the entire moon. Okay. We are just focusing on these two areas where maximum uh, things are going to happen. You know, maximum, uh, let's say, growth is going to happen on moon. Excellent. Okay. Johan? Thank you very much. Yes, Johan, if you would like to go on, uh, if you have questions or feedback for the team. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. Thank you uh, also to the team. Uh, also, great presentation. Congratulations from my side. Um, I think also congratulations on taking the leap and actually uh, going for a company. I think this is um, this is always very daring. And um, since Jan already covered the moon, I come back to Earth, and I think there's a pattern here um, <laughs> today. So my question is this. Um, you're you're going for the moon and i think this is uh, this is great but uh for your company since you pitched your company to us um how are what's your business model how are you going to survive um the time until you go to the moon um what what plans do you have for that um and uh yeah i mean what time frame do you see to to be um to be able to live off the moon um with your company so um thank you for the question and uh, yeah this is a very valid question i think and we have been asked this question uh, and actually this was the question that uh, gave us a lot of uh, confidence in our technology so uh, when we were developing this technology for moon um, we were also uh, encountered this question what do you provide to the existing market why are you targeting a market that does not exist yet right so i think that is what your question actually is uh, what, what are you targeting with the existing market so with the existing market i would say there are there are multiple options first of all i will cover the space market of the earth uh, which is the earth space market earth observations and earth orbits here we are trying to provide these communication systems and antennas so the the thing is uh, we we as i said we want to take step ahead now we want to enable reusability of satellites so we are trying to plan our antennas and our communication systems in such a way that they enable reusability so if you have there are some communication systems available that can go for reusability but uh, you also need an antenna for it if your antenna does not support your reusability new frequencies then you cannot work because your antenna will block your signal so this is where we are trying to have a common pair of technology which is two uh, technology lines we are developing which will enable this reusability and this is where we start providing our communication so we are trying to be a system integrators or system providers uh, in the upstream um, production line uh, this is where we want to be but uh, uh, not, uh, not just stopping here we also think our antennas has applications uh, in in a diverse way because antennas are not just in space antennas are everywhere around us so uh, for example iot applications the antennas we are developing ve can very well fit into these iot application and iot is already very big and we will target this uh, iot now and uh, further speaking logistics uh, who wants to track their their cargo who wants to track their uh, shipments uh, and want to use these gps this is another way we we can put our communication systems and antennas into into these and actually we were also encountered by a question from uh, uh, from one of our uh, partners uh, what can you do with uh, you know space tourism or with uh, civil tourism aircraft flights now we know that there are some mega constellations coming up uh, with the connectivity of the internet throughout the world actually our antennas are so small and uh, unlike array antennas which can do beam steering we have these small antennas that can be put on different locations on the aircraft fuselage outside and they will have different viewing angle altogether without any interference now you are covering bigger bigger area without any uh, need to do beam bearing but having multiple small antennas and having a common communication system to it so we can provide an internet internet connectivity to these in or uh, in flight or civil aircrafts uh, where passengers are looking for this kind of facilities and airlines are looking for these kind of facilities so there are actually mul multiple uh, multiple areas that we can venture out but for all this as uh, as uh, udit told we are looking for for fundings so this is one challenge we are facing right now as every startup face so this is uh, i think a common story nothing nothing new here but we are looking with multiple earth markets non space markets space markets we you will see us i think <laughs> thank you very much mayank any more questions uh, johan on your side or feedback for the team no it's fine i'm, I'm also happy that they, they are creating a company now so this is a good way forward so go ahead perfect thank you and thank from you space office um, yes, actually, I have one follow-up question. Maybe if I, if we have time, um, uh, I I didn't see anything about um, the IP you generated and your IP strategy. And since we're talking business already, um, can you can you share a bit there? I think this is also very interesting um, to understand how you approach that and uh, what what your plans are in this area. Exactly. Thank you for the question again, sir. So uh, the IP. Uh, now we have these two technology timelines which are working in parallel. Um, I would start with antenna. So in the antenna, the antenna designs basically would be our IP. 
we are designing this and uh, we are not just designing the antennas actually we are also trying to play with the materials that are used for designing the antenna so some kind of r&d that we will do in antennas as well and for that we have already started talking with uh, our our um, isa partner uh, or is a big partner that we got is from offer ias from uh, nuremberg so we will talk with them and there are there are other other uh, players in the in the industry which we can talk and we can do this r&d which is according to me personally is one of the key factor that can enhance the the performance of much better than uh, much better than what already exists in the market there there is a need to improve this secondly uh, i would come to the communication system now there are many communication systems who are working on this uh, field uh, and who has this capability who work on software defined radio so the the key enabler would be on the software side where we are trying to achieve some some kind of exceptional result when we are and we are focusing relay satellites in our in our um, technology development that a satellite needs to connect with multiple systems at the same time with different uh, communication standards now if we are able to achieve this then this won't be available anywhere in the market for now people are trying to develop this still and uh, secondly uh, the system you saw today that was working it worked on 1 watt of power which is the lowest you will find in the market now so this is uh, something which is really specifically tailored towards the small satellite uh, uh, industry and this is where i can already tell you we are targeting small satellite industry or customers or or constellations with less than 20 or 30 satellites uh, going up in the constellation who would love to integrate the system rather than developing them so just uh, giving you extra information on the question <laughs> but uh, that's it Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think with this we conclude uh, your presentation, Mayan and Celestial team. Congratulations again, and thank you, Johan and Jim, for the feedback. Just one one moment, I would take. I would uh, like to call Robert here, who is helping us a lot from PTS, and uh, he has been a great support with equipment, with guiding us uh, also on the presentation. So please, Robert, say something. <laughs> I can say something like hello, for example. Yeah, I'm really happy um, here at PTS to support efforts like Celestial, and <clears throat> yeah, I really think it's a great project. And I'm very happy the presentation work because I really know what was happening, how it's working, and I know that SDR is a pretty cool technology, something that the moon really needs. So we're happy to help. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank so, you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you also on, on our side for supporting the team. It's really nice environment. Actually, it's a really nice presentation that they are there. at your premises. Thank you. Uh now let's move to the next team. We have P15 Power Hub. Are you ready in back in Scotland? Uh yes, we just load it up. Apologize for these technical difficulties. P15 to introduce them briefly. Uh, they this is the second time they participate in the Gluna project. So the first time uh, last year, also another team of students uh, built power system, and this time they took it to to the next level. Uh, different student teams, but again in the same topic of a, a power hub. for igluna so welcome to you and thank you for for your presentation today uh, sorry about the delay there um good morning jan johan and uh, everyone watching at home um it's a privilege to present to you this morning and um, my name is drew gillespie and i'm the team leader and systems engineer for the power hub team we are a group of fourth and fifth year master students from the university of strathclyde in glasgow scotland in the uk And today we'd like to give you an overview of the work we've conducted over the past year through our academic project and the Agluna 2020 project and showcase some of the concepts behind our system. Uh today I'm glad to be joined by four of my fellow team members, Gareth Mitchell, our co-team leader and lead satellite engineer, Finley Rowe, our battery systems engineer, Gavin Roger, our fuel cell engineer, and Donald Martin, our Mission analysis and orbital mechanics engineer. So, uh, 
Is it still streaming? And we're back. Uh, our objective this year has been to design a reliable power system capable of supporting a lunar base. And to ensure we were able to provide this critical element, we had to establish some requirements to help us accomplish our objective. Uh, firstly, after coordinating with the other teams and incorporating some of the lessons we've learned from the International Space Station power system, we derived a requirement of around 150 kilowatts to cover all aspects of the base. Secondly, we had to ensure consistent power supply throughout the lunar night. By optimizing the location of our outpost, we managed to reduce the period of darkness our um, solar arrays would experience to a maximum of 52 hours by positioning our base near the peaks of eternal sunlight, the peaks of the mountains at the lunar south pole. Lastly, we needed to minimize the resources required to be transported to the moon in order to minimize the mass, cost, and complexity. Previously, Celestial and Ampex have discussed how expensive and uh, resource inefficient it can be to simply transport um, materials to the moon at such a great cost. So we managed to target this by incorporating several in situ resource techniques using the materials already available on the lunar surface. And to meet these requirements, our team has developed a number of systems to provide a resilient and holistic approach to this problem. So let's start with how we intend to generate the energy. During Eglona 2019, the PowerHab team focused on ground-based solar arrays now, whilst these are a very mature technology and would surely be part of our system, they do have one fundamental flaw or issue. They don't work in the dark. Um, so we decided to take a different focus this year. And that was solar power satellites. Essentially, large solar arrays in space, these orbit the moon as a single satellite. This is beneficial as it allows power generation, no matter whether the base is in lunar night or day conditions. Our system uses two solar wings, totaling an area of approximately 5,200 meters squared, or about the same size as half of an American football field, or more easy to understand for us Europeans, a rugby pitch. Um, but despite their size once deployed, the uniform nature of the 16 winglets which make up the array allow it to be folded during launch. This means that the SPS can be launched inside of a typical five meter fading on top of a rocket with some additional volume to spare. The solar arrays we're using incorporate triple junction solar cells. For those at home, this is essentially three layers of solar cell, um, which increase the efficiency of the cell to approximately 30%. We did consider quadruple junction cells, so essentially four layers, However, we traded this extra percent efficiency gain with the vastly greater mass that would be uh, seen with the quadruple junction cells. And so we settled on the 30% triple junctions. The moon would be an ideal environment to showcase this technology and develop it further for use back at Earth, where it could help to revolutionize how we generate energy. And it is in fact already being tested with pilot system demonstrations such as that of the US Naval Laboratories demonstrator on the X-37B space plane, which launched only a few months ago. The moon would be particularly ideal because of its lack of atmosphere. This is important in transferring power from orbit to the surface, something we intend would happen using microwave wireless power transmission. And to tell you a bit more about how this wireless power transmission would work, I'd like to hand you over to Gary. Thank you, Drew. Wireless power transmission can be split into two distinct types. Near field transmission, which is achieved over a relatively small distance, and far field transmission, which is achieved over a very long distance. Solar power satellites look to move the solar power panels into space for the benefits outlined by Drew. 
The energy received by these solar panels has to be transferred using far field transmission. Far field transmission uses electromagnetic waves, either in the form of light waves using a laser or microwaves. For our project, we decided that microwaves would be more beneficial over a laser since they have a higher efficiency and therefore will result in a lower launch mass. It was also decided that the microwaves would be emitted by a gyrotron, which allows for high frequencies and has a high power density. To receive the microwaves, our antenna was chosen, as a simple design means it's cheap and highly scalable. It can also facilitate on-site printing if required. A rectifier is made from a simple antenna with rectifying circuit. A rectifying circuit changes alternating current to direct. This allows it to capture the electromagnetic waves and transfer them back into electricity. For the system designed by our project, we decided on microwaves with a frequency of 94 gigahertz. The size of rectenna needed to receive these waves is about 0.124 square kilometers. For an FPS system of this size, the solar panels required would cause the satellite's launch mass to be well beyond current capabilities. To scale the satellite down to a more manageable size, it was decided that we'd increase the solar radiance on the panels using reflector satellites. The reflector satellites focus the sunlight onto the solar panels and they are made from a very thin mylar coated in aluminium, giving the satellite an aerial density of around 4 grams per meter squared. These satellites are a lot lighter than the solar cells they replace, which means that the overall system weight is reduced by 88%. The solar panels going go from being the aforementioned 5,200 meters squared to only 650 meters squared. These satellites start small and compact to ease launch and then expand to over 1,600 meters squared. This is achieved through inflatable beams which plastically harden on expansion. And I'll pass you back to Drew to talk about the storage. Thanks, Gareth. Um, no. Whilst the SPS can provide power throughout the lunar night, it's important in space applications and exploration not to just rely on one source of power, because if that one source fails, then you're essentially kaput. So we also intend to store energy during the lunar day for use during emergencies and for use during the lunar night. The first of our systems is one that's very familiar for storage. batteries. And to discuss our battery storage system, I'd like to introduce you to Finley. Thank you, Drew. Hello, Jan and Johan and everyone else watching. I hope you're enjoying our presentation. So yes, I will be discussing briefly our design battery energy storage system. I will briefly touch on the key factors we considered which influenced our design. We will then look at the design full scale system we arrived at. And finally, we have a developed prototype explanation and demonstration for you to show as well. So firstly, looking at the key mission requirements that we identified. Um, firstly, we felt it was necessary to, determ uh, to determine the power draw during the lunar night in order to size the battery and its storage capacity. With a power draw assumption of 150 kilowatt, uh, kilowatts per hour, based on the International Space Station with marginal upscaling, and over 52 hours during the lunar night, this gives us a battery capacity of 7,800 kilowatt hours. Then looking at environmental capability, as the environmental challenges posed by the lunar surface can be uh, difficult to overcome, uh, we considered the, temp the vast temperature range of minus 240 degrees Celsius during the lunar night, and up to 120 degrees Celsius during the lunar day. These large temperature main, uh, ranges meant that any uh, battery cells we would choose are required to have large operational temperature ranges and uh, sufficient temperature regulation. We also considered the impact of micrometeorites and therefore uh, made it a requirement that our battery system be sturdy and spread out in order to deal with such an event. We also looked at cycle life and ensured that the chosen cells would have a long 
uh, long operational cycle life in order to prolong their degradation as much as possible and minimize the number of future rocket launches that would be required to replace degraded cells. And we also optimize the design to weigh as little as possible to ensure feasibility. Now that you've seen all the key factors considered, we can look at the chosen battery type we arrived at. So, uh, as you can see, we arrived at lithium ion as our battery of choice. And the chosen cell chemistry we arrived at was lithium nickel cobalt aluminium oxide, more commonly known as NCA. It is a very good commercially available cell and its strengths can be high, are highlighted in the spider diagram. Uh, the key points of note are its high specific energy and power, as well as its good operational lifespan, making it an ideal choice for a lunar habitat mission. Now looking at the module design, we can see that we used 516 uh, NCA cells in a six series 86 parallel configuration, similar to the Tesla Model S. Each module weighs approximately 20 kilograms and provides six kilowatt hours of storage. And it was then decided that each, each battery bank would have 26 of these modules attached in series and that the bank would be able to store 150 kilowatt hours of energy, which is enough to power the habitat for one hour. Now looking at the uh, um, battery bank, as you can see in the dimensions, as well as a few key points, as the battery bank has enough capacity to power the habitat for one hour, we require 52 of these. Um, the banks were sized in order to be linearly scalable with hours of capacity and also was designed in order to be small to minimize the risk of meteorite impact. It follows a modular design and amasses a total of approximately 700,000 lithium ion cells, which is equivalent to 80 Tesla Model S's. However, on the bright side, we assumed that there's already one Tesla in space and so we would only need 79. Now looking at the main cons of lithium ion that we considered, um, the, the most significant con of lithium ion is their safety and risk of explosion in an event that is known as thermal runaway. Thermal runaway occurs when internal cell boundaries deteriorate within a cell, and this results in an extremely uh, uh, in an unstoppable short circuit and heats the cell to the point of explosion. This can be extremely dangerous, and so in order to consider lithium ion even a possibility for the lunar habitat, we had to ensure sufficient safety would be provided. So we looked into how manufacturers achieve this, and they use what is known as a battery management system, or BMS. A BMS is tasked with monitoring cell voltage and temperature and preventing thermal runaway from occurring, uh, occurring using methods such as cell balancing and battery disconnect. When considering what prototypes we could bring to the field campaign, we felt it was not possible to produce a full-scale system prototype, and so we felt that a BMS would offer a good alternative and provide an insight into just how battery systems are protected. So we manufactured an off-the-shelf prototype with the help of our sponsors, RS Components, who provided the necessary equipment to work from home during lockdown. Now looking at the BMS design itself, in the top right you can see um, a top level design. It uses an Arduino Nano microcomputer in order to monitor three cells in series. This then displays their voltages and uh, status update to the, uh, to the LCD screen. The BMS follows a monolithic design, meaning, it that, meaning that it can monitor as many cells as it has inputs for, and also provides cell balancing and emergency stop functionality uh, for extra safety. Now we can move on and show you the physical developed prototypes. Here we can see the two prototypes developed. Prototype 1, which was manufactured on a breadboard, and when, uh, upon completion of assembly, we noticed that it suffered from loose connections and was found to not be very portable. Therefore, we felt a second prototype was necessary to be manufactured. Prototype 2, which was manufactured on a Vero board, required much less space and was far more portable, and actually turned out to be safer and easier to use due to its soldered connections. Now we're going to show you a video demonstration and explanation of Prototype 1, so I hope you enjoy. Hello everyone out of Luna 2020. My name's Finlay, if you didn't already know, 
and today I'm going to be talking you through my battery management system prototypes and giving you a demonstration of battery management in action. Firstly, let's look at the battery pack. It contains three lithium ion NCA cells all combined in series and each cell should be sitting around 3.7 volts of charge which I will just check. Cell 1 gives us 3.71 volts. Cell 2 gives us 3.71 volts. And cell 3 gives us 3.7 volts. The pack also has three output wires, brown, yellow and green, corresponding to a different positive terminal of the pack. The brown wire should output 3.7 volts, as that's the output of cell 1. The yellow wire should output 7.4 volts, as that's a combination of cell 1 and cell 2. And the green wire should output 11 volts, as that's a combination of cell 1, cell 2 and cell 3. We also have an emergency stop button, which disconnects the 11 volt supply uh, in the event of an emergency or a fused short circuit, and will prevent the circuit from being damaged. Looking at the circuitry involved, we have the Arduino Nano, which is the BMS microcomputer. It has multiple analog and digital pins, which allow for sensor reading inputs and control signal outputs. It is powered completely by the battery pack, as you can see, which makes it a standalone BMS option and not at risk of drawing additional current from any power sources like a laptop. This is very important as too much current can be dangerous in battery management, which could lead to thermal runaway. Moving on, down here we have the voltage sensing element of the BMS, which takes the battery pack output voltages, divides them using a voltage divider made up of two resistors, and sends an analog signal input to the Arduino. The voltage division is extremely important as we are dealing with high voltages from the battery pack, and we wouldn't want that running directly into the BMS as it could cause damage. Over here we have the LCD screen which is currently displaying the individual measured cell voltages as well as a status update telling us the circuit is okay, nothing is discharging and no faults have been detected. Up here we have the cell balancing circuitry which comes into effect if any of the measured cell voltages are found to be at unsafe levels. I have the Arduino programmed to commence cell balancing if any of the cells are recorded at above 4.2 volts, which is based on lithium ion safety standards. In such a case, an output signal is sent from the Arduino through the corresponding cell circuitry. This will allow voltage to flow from, uh, through these MOSFETs that you can see and discharge the corresponding cell. The relevant LED will light and the excess cell charge will either be redistributed amongst the remaining cells or dissipated into the ground. Here, I'm going to quickly demonstrate the cell balancing circuitry I just described in action. I have calibrated the Arduino with an offset for cell 3 so that it now reads 4.31 volts and we get a status indication that we are in discharge mode. Now, if we look at the circuit, we can see that cell th the cell 3 LED has lit up. This indicates that, se uh, that voltage is flowing through this part of the circuit and the cell is discharging. If I was to leave this, it would discharge to 4.2 volts and you would see the excess voltage spread across the remaining two cells. So there you have cell balancing. And finally, in here, we have the input current regulator which would shut off the incoming power to the battery pack if the cells were fully charged. There would be a power supply connection over this MOSFET. However, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate this as I require a specific cell charger power supply, which I do not have with me at home. Nevertheless, the functionality is there and the protection is in place. So there you have it, a live demonstration of a battery management system. I hope you enjoyed and learned a few things and I hope you enjoy the rest of my presentation.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video. I certainly don't enjoy watching it back so many times, but I hope you enjoyed. Um, the prototype performed really well and monitored the cells accurately and safely. We will be looking at how we can demonstrate a more sc uh, scale system at future field campaigns. So thank you both for listening to my section. It's been an honor and I'll uh, to present to you both and I'll pass you back to Drew. Thanks, Finley. Uh, now, still focusing on our storage systems, we'd like to discuss something particularly interesting and that's the use of resources on the moon for power storage. And to help explain the first of our in situ systems, I'd like to introduce Gavin, who's going to talk to you about our novel fuel cell system. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gavin, and I'll be explaining our hydrogen fuel cell system and the many decisions we made for the system and why we made them. Fuel cells work differently for different types. The type of fuel cell we'll be using in the system is a proton exchange membrane, otherwise known as PEM fuel cells. These work by having a thin layer of material known as a membrane between the hydrogen gas chamber and the oxygen, oxygen gas chamber. The table shown is a pew matrix, which was used to narrow down the choices down to the top three. The main choices were between the alkali fuel cell, the PEM fuel cell, and the solid oxide fuel cell. The PEM fuel cells were decided upon for the possibility of their technological advancements before the mission, as the PEM membranes are becoming less expensive and more lightweight. The PEM type of fuel cell also has a favorable temperature range, a high power density, and low weight, which makes it ideal for this application. PEM fuel cells have average efficiencies of 40 to 60 percent, with a theoretical high of 83 percent, which is very efficient for many types of fuel cells. The storage of the hydrogen and oxygen for the system on the moon base was decided to be stored in high pressure containers, which will be buried beneath a layer of moon rock to help protect from meteorites that bombard the surface. The choice of material for the storage would be a composite, as they are strong and light, and this enabled the choice to be carbon fibre. The fuel cell system will use electrolysis through an electrolyzer. The electrolyzer can be powered by our solar setup to produce hydrogen and oxygen gas for when the solar system cannot produce the necessary power for the habitat. There are many forms of electrolyzer we can use, however, as PEM fuel cells need extremely pure hydrogen, a PEM electrolyzer is the best choice for such high purity. The water will be harvested from ice found on the moon from the South Pole, where there is an abundant source. The water here can be used to power the fuel cell by using the electrolyzer to break down the ice into these gases. The technology that can be used to acquire the water is an aqua factorum machine, which NASA is currently producing. It was chosen as it has the lowest power requirement out of the other choices. PEM fuel cells need a temperature of 60 to 100 degrees Celsius as to not degrade the membrane. And to regulate the temperature, we are using a system of reflective mirrors to heat the moon rock above the fuel cell. The system is known as a thermal wadi system, and you can see it in the presentation. The model shown is an example of our fuel cell system and how it would look once it's all put together. The cylinders are the oxygen and hydrogen storages, the bigger being the hydrogen storage. The blue section are the compressors for the high pressure storage. The white section is the reflective heating system with the fuel cells and electrolyzer underneath. The system has been produced in a way that we can place it anywhere that has water and sunlight and power can be stored and produced. Thanks for listening and I'll pass you back to Drew. Thanks Gavin. Lastly, we just wanted to introduce you to one of our developing systems, which we hope to take forward next year at Figlina 2021. And I am of course talking about our thermal mass storage system. 
This system uses concentrated solar energy to heat a pipe containing a working fluid. This fluid then vaporizes and travels through the piping system to heat up the thermal mass. This thermal mass is a one meter cube made of lunar regolith soil, which acts like a big thermal battery storing the energy as heat. This heat can then be used to run a Stirling engine, which is a kind of heat engine which can generate power during the lunar night by converting the heat to electrical energy. To accomplish the 150 kilowatt generation requirement alone, we would require six of these thermal mass systems. And to sufficiently heat each cube, we would require an area of around half a tennis court. However, the modularity of this system and the ability to be produced in situ on the moon means that we can use less cubes or more cubes in combination with other systems. And that is the last piece in our power system puzzle. So to recap, it starts with our reflector satellite, which reflects and focuses the solar radiation towards the SPS, which converts this to electrical energy and then again into microwave energy, which is beamed down to a receiver station on the ground, which would be situated somewhere behind the solar panels that you can see here. The receiver station is part of what we call our ground system, which also includes the ground-based solar arrays. Energy from the ground system can be routed directly to the habitat for use during the day, or it can also be used to charge our storage systems which then during the lunar night or during emergencies can route power directly to the habitat for use. Storage could also incorporate our thermal mass system, which can also function as a base load during the day. We envision a staggered deployment of these systems, starting with the most mature technologies, such as the battery storage and ground-based solar arrays both of which have a technology readiness level of nine, meaning that they've been validated in their operational environment. This would enable generation and storage of power, whilst the necessary infrastructure is delivered, installed, and tested for additional systems, such as the hydrogen fuel cell, thermal mass, or wireless power transmission rectenna. This also provides additional flexibility in the program, to accommodate such aspects as budgetary changes or changes in administration or objectives. And that is PowerHub. Thank you for watching. And a massive thank you to our sponsor, RS Components, who helped us to deliver the systems presented today, despite the lockdown challenges. We'd also like to thank uh, everyone who has contributed to our crowdfunding campaign and also all of the amazing advisors we've worked with from the Swiss Space Centre and the University of Strathclyde. You can keep up to date with us on LinkedIn. We'll be presenting at the online edition of the IAC 2020 in October, or you can contact us directly if you're in need of any extra engineers at ESA. Thanks. Thank you very much for your great presentation, and thank you to all the Power Hub team. We are very happy to see your concept, how it's came together. It's very complete, taking into account all the challenges of uh, the lunar environment, but as well uh, having it very complete with the, with the collection, the storage, and the generation as well. So thank you very much for presenting your, your concept today to us again. And well, now let's move on to the feedback part. So let's uh, start with ESA Director General. Do you have any inputs, please? Yes, hello and congratulations to your very nice work and to, to the presentation. For, especially, I, I liked very much that you did not look just to one storage system because that is, uh, let's say, the mistake of many people they, that, that they are focused on one technology only and don't see that there are other technologies. However, when you're looking to the different technologies, you, you are looking to, to the heat uh, storage, you are looking also to hydrogen and oxygen. You were looking also uh, to batteries. My question is, did you also look to the overall cycle, meaning from production to transport, um, and then also to recycling? Did you take into account recycling in your analysis? When you say recycling, do you mean um, the 
recycling of the, the materials, so the decommissioning, or do you mean yes. re recycling of the resources such as the hydrogen, the oxygen, water? You are bringing the batteries to the moon. So, and after some time, these, these batteries are not any longer working. So, what do you do with the old batteries? Um, I, I think Finlay is that may be probably best answered by you. Um, I'm afraid to say that's not something we really considered as uh, in our study. We were more focused on um, get, getting the system set up. But, uh, it would definitely be something we can add in for our future uh, field campaigns, but I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. Yes, my recommendation is you should. And another recommendation is you were looking for the production of hydrogen and oxygen to electrolysis. There is also, there are different methods to use direct uh, uh, sunlight to produce hydrogen and oxygen out of water. So you should have also a look to that because that might also have a better efficiency than uh, going through this uh, electrolysis uh, process. But this is just a hint. Thank you very much. It was a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Werner. Uh, Johan Richard, do you have something to add to the discussion? Any questions to the team? Yeah, I have, uh, I, I actually have to. First of all, let me join uh, DT in congratulating the team. I think your uh, presentation was very uh, thorough and also very concise, so that was much appreciated. Um, uh, my, my question goes a bit into the direction, or the hint goes a bit into the direction of the, what Disa DT just said about the, the recycling. In terms of batteries, um, as far as I've seen, you've concentrated on lithium ion. Did you also look in, uh, let's say, uh, more sustainable technologies? which have their own problems, like, for example, salt batteries, uh, which is a topic which is coming up also for uh, for terrestrial uh, solar plants. And um, I think we had the question on the transport. That would have been another question. Um, but yeah, my question on the, on, the, on, the, on the battery technologies. And by the way, Finlay, I liked the demonstration video and I really liked your uh, emergency stop button. It shows you're taking safety very serious. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I was ensuring to not electrocute myself. Um, so, yeah, good question. Um, the battery types we considered in our study were previously used um, space mission batteries. So we looked at uh, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride and lead acid. Whilst this didn't include any um, maybe more environmentally friendly options, um, we just felt for the study of our, or the purpose of our study that in order to ensure um, like that the, the system will work, we would choose uh, we would choose from batteries that have already seen use in space. And so uh, as with the re uh, recycling, we would definitely incorporate this into our future um, field campaign events and provide a study on that. I think I, think I could probably add a, a wee bit on there. Um, for example, what I talked about at the end of the presentation, using the, the more mature technologies to begin with, um, a lot of our technologies are um, systems which have a much lower technology readiness level. Um, so we wanted to ensure that whilst those systems were being implemented on the moon, we would have proven reliable um, systems, which were modular we could use to scale, say, if one of our Envision systems didn't work out, we could add, add on extra battery banks. Um, but certainly to begin with, uh, we wanted to use something that was definitely qualified for space use. Thank you very much for your answer. Is there any more feedback or questions, Johan, from your part to Space Office uh, to wrap up the session? No, I think uh, thank you again. It was very uh, inspiring and very interesting. I really enjoyed uh, all the three projects, um, but also the last one very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan. And um, is a Director Ge General, um, yes. Jan Werner, anything to add? Tatiana, I'm not only congratulating these three teams, but also the other teams uh, which participate in IGLUNA 2020. I congratulate you and your team. So great achievements. Let's find uh, possibilities to go on with Luna. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. And thank you again to all the teams. Yes, the ones, the three ones we have today and all the other teams who participated as well. I would also, as we have still a minute, like to thank our viewers. 
I'm quickly checking uh, the YouTube chat we have now live, and there's many supportive teams uh, to, uh, comments to the teams, but there's also uh, a question that keeps coming up to the, our experts is a director general and Swiss space office, as they are saying that uh, Igluna is helping, uh, as they can see, to develop the, the space sector. So they are wondering what's the thoughts from, uh, from you on your side on how we're doing things from Igluna to develop new technologies, even creating startups as we saw with Celestial. Would you have any inputs you would like to add to this discussion on this point? So you, you saw already that there are direct uh, steps beyond uh, this Igluna ISA lab uh, to that some of them are creating companies uh, with the help of uh, either big or without the help of either big. In any case, it's for the individuals of Igluna. It's of course a big step forward for also for a professional career. And we as ESA, we are very interested in all these technologies and ideas developed at Igluna, Igluna because we can maybe use them in this or that project. So there are several paths, not only one uh, solution, so what to do with uh, all of these results. So I really like also this international dimension of Igluna, so therefore this is also a value which I really support. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, Johan from the Swiss Space Office, would you like to add anything else? Well, I think uh, Isadici already uh, already uh, summarized very well. There are, of course, many different options to pursue. And I, I mean, for uh, uh, as, as speaking for the Swiss delegation, we're, of course, open to discuss with all the teams uh, located in Switzerland if they have plans to build, to build a company or uh, to participate in, in, in projects um, in the future, for example, with ESA, then, of course, you can come to us and, uh, and ask us directly and discuss these opportunities. And for all the other teams as well, I think uh, you, have, uh, you have your delegations, you can approach them as well, and, of course, ESA. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and the congratulations again also from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you again, all the teams and Johan, uh, Richard, and also Jan Werner uh, for joining us today. We're very happy. We'll see Johan Richard later today for the closure ceremony in one more hour at 13 hours Central European time. So everyone stay tuned. See you for the last event in one hour. And thank you again, everyone. And see you next time. Goodbye.